Thank you very much. First of all, Clemens and, uh, and, and, and uh, Mariana and Klaus for organizing this wonderful conference for getting us together. I heard the word from Lars, enforcing the rule. So I'm, I'm a little nervous. I'm, I'm going to go speak a little faster. Usually that's not a good solution for giving good talks, but, <laughs> but I prepared maybe too many slides for, I thought it was a 45 minute talk, but 30. All right. Um, so I will be trying to be a little quick, but maybe the, if anything, the, maybe this is actually the most important slide of my talk, which is what, is, what sets the limit for atomic clock or for quantum sensor from that point of view? Uh, how do we scale quantum systems where you, you just simply want to push the frontier of measurement science? And this was something that we were very intrigued when the LIGO first detected gravitational wave. They were able to see things you know, when you can measure strings at 10 to minus 21, 10 to minus 22, you start to hear black holes colliding, neutron stars colliding. It just feels very inspirational. So at the time we thought, well, could we think about, you know, scaling quantum systems like strontium optical lattice clock, where you put a one million atoms in a three dimensional optical lattice. You put a coherence time of 120 seconds where the atoms are supposed to, to be able to have. And, and then you will be able to just using that, you, you can come up with a clock precision at a few points parts 10 to the 20 at a second. And at, the, at that time, when we were thinking about systems like this, this our performance was a four orders of magnitude below this. And, uh, but now, actually, in, over the intervening uh, five years or so, we actually did a push a factor of 100 beyond. And we'll, we'll see if we can get another factor of 100. Because if you get to that level of a precision, um, Shimon and I wrote a paper together about, you know, it's actually possible to build a clock like this to be, to really sense gravitational effects, whether it's gravitational waves or gravity effects in, uh, in, a, in a quantum mechanical system like a many body system where gravity will be explicitly included. So now I'm talking about something which is, you know, you want to say, you want to be intellectually honest to see whether you can get there. And, and it, so you cannot just say, well, the atoms are going to interact, so I'm going to pull them apart. Uh, you don't have infinite amount of power in the lasers. Uh, we want to pack as many atoms as possible in a system like this. And you have to answer this question. As you pack millions of atoms in a, in a, in a ball of crystals made out of laser light, would these atoms impact the measurement precision? Would, this, would, the, would the systematic uncertainty being going out of control because you have so many atoms? This is no longer ordinary matter. It's a quantum matter with a very in, intensely interacting uh, range of forces, and, if, and in fact, it's actually true over the past year or so, we have been starting to understand the system better and better by looking at the range of forces from short range, like contact interactions, to van der Waals interactions, to collective dipolar effects, to super exchange interactions, and so on. Clock becomes like almost like a, a mechanism to study magnetism, but the, all, all of this is really connected to these two questions, how we can continue to improve the measurement precision without impacting the systematic uncertainty. So this connects to really the idea uh, of uh, the, over the past three decades of a quantum metrology. If you think about designing a quantum system with really long coherence time, put as many atoms or ions or whatever, your, your favorite atoms into the system so they can achieve the standard quantum limit scales with the number of particles, uh, square root of it. And then start to think about Hamiltonians where you can optim do optimization and enhancement. They'll put entanglement into a quantum system. And, and as we can see, the, the, the entire field of uh, quantum physics and AMO has been giving us these tools where the quantum control of individual quantum particles, laser technology, frequency combs, and quantum gases, and so on. All together, it's really a revolution going on in our field. You know, this, uh, this is a change of slope of the progress of atomic clocks, and I think this revolution is still ongoing. And in fact, that's true. If we look back uh, a few years ago, the measurement precision reached the field past 10 to the 19, accuracy 10 to minus 18. Well, today, the measurement precision that the Shaman will also tell you about, it's not reaching below 10 to the minus 20. Accuracy, everything else has been calibrated to three times 10 to the minus 19. The only thing left is the BBR, and the BBR is actually being calibrated to be below 10 to minus 18. I think I'm talking to Mariana very actively right now to get this number to be, to, to be as low as possible because that was set accuracy. But it, what's re I'm really proud of is this, this number because I'm putting on so many atoms into the quantum system, and you must understand the many-body Hamiltonian to be able to say 
uh, to claim systematic effects at the 10 to minus 19 level. And I, I argue, you know, in some sense, DVR is a single particle effect. You cool this down, you know, even like from room temperature down to 10 degree Celsius, it makes a huge impact on the dynamic DVR, that, which is limiting us. So it's, you don't actually have to go to cryogenic. But, but the many body physics is actually a much more interesting area. And I want to also, we just, just heard a talk from Peter Zoller about Hamiltonian learning, Hamiltonian design, and had a great discussion with him on Friday. I add this word in there because of the inspiration from Peter, but you know, I was thinking about if you understand many body Hamiltonian, they can learn how to control many body Hamiltonian to enhance the precision. So you can go back and back and systematic and, and, and precision. But Peter's point is, well, you, maybe you can actually design Hamiltonian that, that even go beyond what, uh, whatever the system gave to you. You can add knobs and add, add a control into the system. So I will give you a couple examples of this if I have time. Uh, so maybe just very brief, lasers we use are using these, uh, this, benefiting from this long-term collaboration between PTB, German Standards Lab, and Jella. We have been developing these cryogenic silicon crystals, giving us a laser coherence of uh, uh, tens of seconds. And I just want to give you a quick slide since we are talking about the whole field. We are trying to push the limit uh, on laser stability. For example, now in, inside this crystalline cavity, we are trying to replace the coding from amorphous coding with a crystalline coding and try to really lower the local fluctuation, so-called the thermal noise uh, limit, due to the fact that the mechanical structures always have loss and the dissipation leads to fluctuation. So we're using crystal structure. And indeed, uh, the design goal is to, to get to a laser stability of one part 10 to 17. In fact, it can even go below maybe to the mid part 10 to the 18. As we were doing, performing these measurements, uh, we discovered something new. Uh, for example, we identified there's a bifringent noise of these crystalline coatings, but we can cancel that. Um, and we can also verify thermal Brownian noise indeed is very low, one times 10 to minus 17. But there is unfortunately another global noise that's, see, we don't know the origin of it, but it seems to come, come from the properties of a semiconductor that's limiting us at a few parts 10 to the 17, or two or three parts 10 to the 17. That's the current uh, state of the art we are trying to understand this. And it turns out this is very relevant for LIGO, and so we have been doing some collaboration with them. Coming back to atoms. This idea of putting atom, neutral atoms for quantum metrology really has, uh, going back to the 90s when people were thinking about how to design optical traps where the ground state and excited state experience the same AC structure. And I want to credit these two gentlemen, uh, Kadetoshi Katori, who's been thinking about strontium clocks in Japan uh, since the late 90s. I was a postdoc with this gentleman, Jeff Kimball, uh, in the late 90s on cavity QED, and we're thinking about similar ideas, putting single atom in a cavity, how do you achieve magical wavelength trapping so that you don't have heating problems. And, and it comes out, because you can create this magic wavelength, you can decouple the so-called spin motion or decoupling the spin is your internal uh, electronic states. The motion is, of course, quantized motions in the optical lattice. And you can see the Doppler effect is removed. You have the carrier in there, and all the Doppler effects are manifested in those sidebands. Red sideband and blue sideband indicating how low the temperature you have achieved for these atomic gas in the lattice. And I want to, uh, you can actually see very interestingly, you can see these uh, landscapes of this individual peaks. Turns out these individual peaks are single photon recoils because these traps are aharmonic and you can actually resolve individual uh, emotional levels. And if you cool this further down, you, you can actually remove all these peaks away and you can see a single um, blue detuned um, sideband and red has nothing left because the temperature now these atoms are residing absolute ground state in this axial motion. And I also want to highlight just recently with uh, Mariana's th great theoretical work we now understand uh, the so-called magnetic dipole uh, contributions to the AC polarizability. We can now understand overall AC stock shift uncertainty at low parts 10 to the 19. So this gave us this tool of building a very, very shallow uh, 2D array. We actually reduced the intensity of the optical lattice by a factor of 10. It's now at a few parts of uh, just a few photon recoils suspending the atoms in the, uh, against the gravity. And you have this tilted lattice where the atomic wave function is now very weakly confined in individual Vanya orbitals, and you actually use this Bessel function of 
coherence position of individual Vanya orbitals to describe the wave function of atoms sitting in the so-called Vanya stock state. And, and then you can see as the trap depth gets lowered from 12 E recoil to 3 E recoil, this wave function really spreads out over several sites. And there's interesting uh, benefit from this. You know, you can, you can think of these individual pancakes. They are, they are potential, gravitational potential energy is separated by nothing but mgh. H is height, that's a lambda over two. Um, and you have this ground state, excited state wave functions are spread out. Since you are using magic wavelengths, excited state wave function looks just like the ground state. And when you drive the system, you can drive on the so-called on-site excitation. This gives rise to the very long coherence time. But at the same time, you can also drive off-site off uh, excitations where you're putting atoms in a superposition between ground excited state, but also the site I versus site J. So the, the coherence superposition really off, uh, off, uh, is delocalized. <coughs> and in this technique, you can actually think of the, you're doing nothing but an atom interferometer that allow you to measure gravity because the frequency difference, these are actual experimental data. You can see this, the so-called off-site side bands are separated by exactly this gravitational potential energy, mgh. Since we know h very well, we know mass, you can measure the gravity. And this is exactly what atom interferometer would do. Except in this case, you don't throw atoms up. You just confine them in the optical lattice and take advantage of this long coherence time to develop these measurements. So these g's can be measured at the moment without trying very hard at 10 to the eight digits and nine digits or so. But, but in, the main point is you can zoom into here and you can actually look at a clock transition. So let's look at coherence. We have put a 10, 100,000 atoms in there. This is the image of the, uh, on a CCD camera that was a crowd that's suspending about a millimeter tall. And you can look at the coherence by the upper half of the crowd versus the lower half of the crowd, looking at basically a set of a pe quantum pendulums and see how they go in phase or out of phase once they've been excited by the same laser. And you can see if you started the Ramsey fringe, uh, Ramsey coherence uh, sequence, you, you wait for six seconds, the two sets of pendulum are still swinging exactly the same in phase, but it's starting to develop a little bit of a phase shift. If you wait a little longer, half a minute later, you can start to see that it develops into an ellipse. There's a if there's a frequency difference between the upper and the lower half, there's a, going to be a phase shift leading to, of a certain finite time, leading to the dephasing of the oscillation. And you wait almost a minute, and this, the, uh, this process allows you to actually measure the frequency difference between the two regions. The other thing I want to mention really quick, since I'm going to tell you a lot about interactions, is this work really started about 10 years ago when you have individual pancakes at the time when the lattice is still very deep. You can think of pancakes can be individually isolated uh, and treated. And you, you are getting the atoms um, being driven by the laser. And uh, this is the thing have uh, blocks here. You have the quantum noise. But if you let atoms interact for a little while, these are fermions. They have to obey the, uh, the anti-symmetrization of the wave function. If the internal degrees of freedom is symmetrized, external degrees of freedom has to be anti-symmetrized. And this, the so-called P-wave interaction comes in. This P-wave interaction turns out to be very weakly dependent on these motional quanta. So you cannot think of the entire pairwise interaction turns into long range uh, collective interaction. You can define collective spin of N over two and you have a Hamiltonian like single twist Hamiltonian will come out. And this leads to actually quantum noise fluctuation being correlated. At the time, we did not use this technique to generate spin squeezing because it turns out P wave has loss. The, uh, the, the collisional process has, has a loss process involved in this. But nevertheless, this was taught us an important lesson that this, these interactions can give rise to frequency shift. And if you can control it, you can actually use this to, this to do spin squeezing. Fast forward nine years ahead, uh, the, you know, the collaboration with Anna Maria Race Group now allow us to revisit this problem when the trap is much, much shallower. So the atoms can actually go, you know, their wave functions are permeated over several neighboring sites. So you, in addition to the P wave interaction on individual site, you cannot have S wave interaction because the clock laser wavelength is different from the separation of the lattice sites. So you can see each individual pancakes are being addressed by different laser phase, such that these atoms are distinguishable. You can have interacting with S wave. So this gives rise to a really interesting tool. You can adjust the lattice depth, which is affecting the, 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 essentially the competition between the P wave and the S wave 
and, it, and you can see the clock frequency shift follows a very nice trend uh, as you lower the trap depth, the frequency shift going from negative dominated by P wave to positive dominated by S wave. And there's a point, there's a point where there's a, there's a zero crossing and we can measure how well we are canceling this S wave, P wave interactions. And uh, this measurement shows you can, you can cancel the 10 to minus 20 level. So this, this is all set to allow us to really measure uh, gravity, so-called gravitational redshift effects. We can compare the upper half of the clock against the lower, lower half of the atomic ensemble, and just think of there's two clocks running, and I'm just to make a comparison. The nice thing about this comparison is you don't have laser noise because it, th these atoms are being addressed by the same laser. So laser noise is out of the way, and we're just directly comparing the quantum coherence between th two sets of atoms. And this shows, you know, indeed, uh, if you waited 10 to the 5 seconds, you reach precision of 10 to minus 20 and going beyond. The gravitational redshift is 100 micron at, uh, at the 10 to minus 20 level. So uh, if you waited 5, 10 to the 5 seconds, you are starting to measure gravitational redshift at 100 micron scale. And so this was the measurement at simultaneous station among Kokowitz's group in Wisconsin at the time. They, uh, they, made, they, they published a similar result. At the time, Shaman was able to resolve one centimeter or something like that, a gravitational redshift, but now they have done much better. We'll hear from it, him next talk. But this is, of course, the, the point is we are not trying to verify Einstein's correct yet again. This is not what we are trying to do. We're really trying to show, you know, these sort of measurements can start to get to the point where, as this nature cover showed, maybe one day we will be able to actually measure the time difference over just a very tiny dis distance, say a micron, which is a sort of the length scale of a quantum mechanical wave function. Or tens of microns these days, we can actually create entanglement over that distance in the shallow lattice. And this will be interesting in the sense of, well, this is actually due to the discussions with Clemens, uh, Peter, and, and of course a lot with Anna Maria Ray and so on. You know, you, you put in this one simple mass defect in there when the atom gets absorbed with a photon to go from ground to the excited state. The, uh, the mass changes by h, h bar omega zero of a C squared. And you put this mass defect into the single particle Hamiltonian in there. Uh, with in the presence of the, uh, of the magnetic, uh, sorry, in the presence of the gravitational field G, and you can just do a Taylor expansion based on this uh, mass defect. You can immediately pull out both the motional redshift as well as gravitational redshift at a scale that's associated with atoms confined in optical lattice like we have in the, in the, in the, in the laboratory uh, where the distance between the lattice is about a half micron or so. And these are the typical numbers that's coming out of from our experiments. You can see that our measurement precision is not quite there yet to, to see those effects. But if we improve those by another factor of 100, that we'll be able to get to the point where you can actually study the gravity inference on quantum antibody physics, because you can write down a spin Hamiltonians where it governs the on-site interaction P wave, off-site interaction, which is the S wave interactions. And now you have to add this gravity term, redshift. And this redshift will, of course, give rise to a, uh, a terms which are intra-pancakes, which are commuting with the gravitational redshift. And then in between pancakes, they are not commuted with the gravitational shift. These effects you can start to measure. Some of you will immediately point out what's so special about this. If, if I apply the magnetic field gradient, you will have a similar effect like that. And this is true. You know, you can actually say I can use magnetic field gradient to simulate gravity. But the point I want to make is, no, I don't want to use magnetic field to simulate the gravity. I want the gravity to be there so that your know, many body physics actually is influenced by gravity. Plus. The motion of the second order the motion of degree of freedom is not something you can actually simulate with a magnetic field. So there is actually one aspect of universality of gravity that's, that, that's not assimilable by, gravity, by magnetic field. So in order to get another, where do we get this another factor of 100? There's three ways to do this. You make your quantum coherence even better, even longer. You try to Put as many atoms as you possibly can. That's what you can see. I'm trying to transition into 3D optical lattice clock now. <coughs> or you put a spin squeezing into the system. So before I transition to 3D lattice, let me just tell you a little bit about spin squeezing. So in the, in the conventional clock, we have been looking at the superposition. And there's, of course, the measurement process is limited by uh, the so-called quantum projection noise limit. 
and that's why you wanted to put up as many atoms as, as we possibly can where, because the face resolution scales with one over square root of the particle number that you used. But if you can build entanglement, of course, the, the whole point of entanglement is you're trying to replace n copies of quantum noise with just one copy of quantum noise in principle. And that's where the entanglement is most effective, is that quantum noise become, cor become correlated. In that case, you can actually achieve the so-called Heisenberg scaling limit, where the total quantum particles that you have, the, the phase resolution scales the one of n directly instead of the square root of n. So we can learn from some of these pioneers, uh, from, for example, Vladin and James Thompson, Vladin Vulitich, and, and among others, Eugene Pozik and Monica Schleismith and, and Mark Kasevich and so on. They've been doing spin squeezing for a while. And the techniques they use tend to be using cavity, for example, to achieve the all-to-all -all interactions. And we designed this experiment a few years ago with the goal to be able to directly verify the spin squeezing in, uh, uh, advantage in an optical lattice clock where we have this optical lattice can be moved up and down as if atoms are sitting in an elevator and we have a cavity here. This cavity allows you to do collective measurements for sample A and then sample B and do direct comparison. And the idea of strontium, you have this clock states and, the, uh, and then we, there's a triple P1 state that can be used for you to build a cavity QED around this particular transition to act as a spy look at the coherent superposition between the ground and the excited state, and you just want to use a cavity QED field to do so-called quantum non-demolition measurement with the collective physics to read out the population in the, in the ground state. You're spying on the superposition of this atomic system. And indeed, you can put this in the Ramsey sequence. You can indeed re reduce, the laser, uh, reduce this quantum projection noise uh, at the level of the goal was the designing of this was not to do another demonstration experiment, but really implementing this in state of the art. The string squeezing works at a 10 to minus 17 level. You can make argument 10 to minus 17 is no longer state of the art. This is actually true. Uh, this is actually, in fact, is one of the key excitement, I call it, in quantum science. When you think you're making a demonstration of quantum advantage, oftentimes there's another way of doing things better even. And that's just a race which is stimulating us to, 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 to pull all tools out, whether it's entanglement or not, as long as we are pushing science forward, we are winning. So, so yes, yeah, so when we designed it, we said we want to have a spin squeezing working at 10 to minus 17. Now we must continue to work on this to show if the spin squeezing can work at 10 to minus 20, if we want to continue to push on that limit. That would be quite, quite a few decades ahead of us to, to do this, but there are a lot of new ideas how to push this forward. But at the 10 to 17 level, this indeed works. Um, you can see the quantum projection noise is shown by the green um, curve, and, and the, the string squeeze comparison is sitting about 2.5 dBs below that. So, so it's a feeble gain, but it, nevertheless, this is something we want to continue to push. I think uh, we have identified many limiting factors, and we are currently addressing them. I want to point out one very interesting experiment from Adam Kaufman's group recently. Uh, they, they used the tweezer-based short-range interactions to achieve spin squeezing as well. And Anna Maria's talk may actually address that uh, in, in her collaboration with the Rhino Blas group. They achieved the sub-standard uh, quantum limit, but there's a key question here because they used the short-range interaction. The spin squeezing advantage vanishes when, when particle number increases beyond 10. So the question is whether you can use these short range interactions to achieve Heisenberg scaling. Yes, it's possible. You may have to wait a long time for this to, to, to work. And th there is this competition between short range of physics and how do you scale up versus all to all interactions where you can achieve spin squeezing all at once. So with that, all that discussion, now let me move on to the three dimensional optical lattice and tell you a little bit of what we are thinking of achieving these. It's all short range physics. Perhaps we can have dipolar interactions as well, but how do we achieve sort of a, continue to push long coherence, as many number of particles as possible, and still possibly achieving quantum entanglement? Okay, um, maybe it's too much to ask, but at least we can start to look at all these ingredients in a, in a three dimensional optical lattice filled with quantum degenerate gas of fermions. So you can also think of this, uh, 3D Fermi Hubbard model that you can study. The atoms are confined in the lowest emotional band. The spin states are the two clock states, ground state and excited state. 
you have lasers propagating in certain directions, has a Rabi frequency omega, has this geometrical factor, the propagation phase, e to the ikr, and this atom can tunnel, they can have on-site interaction, all these, and they have, you can have a gravity gradient. So there's all these ingredients to just put us on the scale of energy. <coughs> For example, the typical lattice we have, 10 minutes. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, just the typical scale, 100 hertz of tunneling on-site interaction, but kilohertz also, Rabi frequency can be varied from millihertz to the kilohertz, and, uh, and then the gravity is kilohertz per site. So these are just typical energy scales. And this, this interesting laser phase, uh, this is actually is a work Shimon pioneered, actually, when he was still back in our lab at the time in 2017. And I, I told Shimon as we were walking in, I'm going to give him a great card report to you know, Professor Kokowitz of what the seed he planted has now flourishing, you know, just in the recent month. This, the, this is a, a, has something to do which I already touched on, which is laser is propagating at a wavelength of the clock laser, but the spacing of the lattice is confined by the so-called magical wavelength, and there's a phase shift as the laser propagating between different layers of atoms, and this phase shift is very that we know exactly well. It's a seven pi over six. This is nothing but the wavelength ratio of these two relevant lasers. So, so let's put this to work. Uh, we, uh, we fill this lattice with a T over TF of 0.1, uh, kind of a, a quantum gas in there, single spin, nuclear spin. And you can see the sort of, sort of a Mexican uh, pyramid kind of a picture where the top is a flat because you can only fill one, one fermions per site. You can put a, a, for example, a magnetic field gradient across this crowd, and you can actually record the laser atom coherence like this. This, this is a spatial plus spectroscopy imaging technique we're going to use quite a bit later, and it's actually a very interesting technique that Madi, uh, Adam Madi developed back in 2018. So now let me first tell you very quickly uh, the contact interaction, uh, and we're going to move on to super exchange interaction and then move on to dipolar interaction. So, you know, these atoms are confined in the, in the ground state. If you have a nuclear spin of 10 nuclear spin states, you, um, if it's not spin polarized fully, you have some impurity which can interact with atoms with different colors. Those can be actually resolved due to the fact that uh, this on-site interaction is a kilohertz wide. It's, it's about a kilohertz or so. You can see that the, the separation from the carrier where it's dictated by a single atom. And the fact you only see two peaks is due to the, something to do with so-called SEOing symmetry. Uh, the electronic interactions between different nuclear spin states, they all have the same interaction energy. And that's why they, no matter whether, whether you have a two, three, four, five atoms in there, you only have three peaks. Uh, you only ha have two peaks. One is uh, symmetrized, the other one anti-symmetrized peaks. So that's nice. If you have spin impurity, the interaction is out of your concern from your clock in, uh, drive. The next, <coughs> the spin exchange interaction is 3D optical lattice. So now, now the spin is purified. The nuclear spin is purified. There's several spins here, and I don't want to confuse you. There's a nuclear spin, and there's a spin, so-called a pseudo spin. The nuclear spin is a real spin. The pseudo spin is a, the electronic ground in an excited state of the clock. So here now the single nuclear spin state, but you can have a G and an E states, which I still call it uh, two flavor spins. You can have tunneling. You can have on-site interactions. And when in the limit of uh, the so-called insulator limit, uh, you, the, the low energy phys physics is actually captured by the super exchange. If you, if you think of the atom from the left can tunnel to the right, but then there's an on-site interaction there and it pushes it back. The, the atoms can actually swap their positions and that energy scale, the J square over U. And this super exchange interaction was initially proposed by Lu Ming and Michel Luking, and I think a, Peter, Peter Zoller also earlier they had papers like this and was first observed in Emmanuel Bloch's experiment in 2008. But at the time, you know, nobody has actually seen spin, uh, super exchange interactions in a coherent spectroscopy sequence. And if, if you think about the standard uh, super exchange, uh, it looks like a 4J square of a J is tunneling rate, U is on-site interaction. It looks like a Heisenberg interaction, which favors spin alignment. If you put some tilt on it, whether it's gravity or harmonic confinement, you can actually tune you know, this, this factor of J square over U tunes into U over U square minus theta E square, which is the energy difference between enabling sites. So you can immediately see, okay, here's something I can actually tune the interactions by introducing this offset. 
And then you can actually introduce the string orbital coupling where, where you have this laser drive that turns this isotropic Heisenberg interaction into an XXZ interaction. There's an extra term theta coming out, whereas SZ square term is different from SX square plus SY square term. Yes. Thank you. I, I will finish on time. <laughs> Thanks, the chair. Uh, so this XXZ spin Hamiltonian, it's actually really interesting to look at this dynamical phases that's been studied by both Anna Maria Reyes group and Norm Yaw's group. You know, in a, the sign, of course, can de determine whether it's a ferromagnet or anti-ferromagnet on the sign, depending on the sign here. But the idea is the following. When delta equals to one, you have SX squared plus SY squared plus SZ squared. Right, so this is the, the so-called Heisenberg point. And, and the, here you have the all to all interactions going on and you can actually have a long coherence time, except it's not very interesting. It's not generating spin entanglement or anything. If you go onto this Ising and ferromagnet, then immediately you can see the coherence collapse because they want to favor spin alignment. If you come to the left a little bit when delta is a little less than one, then you can actually start to have this single axis twisting delta SZ square term that will allow you to generate a spin entanglement, and this will actually preserve the coherence, uh, except that it takes a long time to develop this spin entanglement. So, so this spin magnet is actually an interesting uh, way to study how do you go from this pure Ising interactions, where it's a short range, the squeezing is not scaling with the system size, to something where you can potentially build spin squeezing across the entire system size, but look at the time scales. So can we play some games, you know, uh, using a three-dimensional optical lattice because it's anisotropic, to try to uh, take advantage of the spin squeezing over the entire system size and the time scale will not become too long. And we study the a grid of Ramsey coherence. You do Ramsey spectroscopy, you essentially prepare the, the spins and you, you let it evolve and look at the contrast. Uh, in, in reality, we use the so-called XY8 decoupling pulse sequences and so on. And then here's experimental grid. We can actually vary the the lattice from, you know, it looks like a pancake or like three-dimensional optical crystals or like tubes. You know, this is, three, this is actually ex experimental data showing the coherence as a function of the mapping of the dimensionality of the optical lattice filled with the almost unity field uh, Fermi uh, gas in there. And I'm going to highlight a particular, this picture of the super exchange interaction. This, in fact, is very interesting. This recovers all our 1B optical lattice work when the, the, the vertical transverse confinement is zero. This is nothing but what I talked about earlier in the 1D system. So here's actually, we start to see the so-called super exchange interaction directly in Ramsey contrast. There's oscillatory behavior of the contrast decay. And this is the way you keep the vertical lattice at a 15E recoil and just vary the how, how, how tight we are squeezing on the transverse directions. And you can actually see if we scale everything into a so-called time scale normalized by the super exchange interaction, all the curves sits right on top of each other and it scales directly with the T square, uh, the U over uh, U square minus theta E square. And even more interestingly, you can actually move this atomic crowd up and down against the harmonic confinement and you can actually tune the interaction energies uh, because of the, the, the the offset and interaction energy can be tuned in this harmonic confinement. You can actually go through various regions where the super exchange interactions are very weak to very strong, sometimes dominated by the offsets, sometimes inter, uh, dominated by the onside interaction, and sometimes the onside interaction is canceled by the energy offsets of individual sites. And you can see this sort of evolution of, uh, this is a theory calculation, but experimental data shows just like that. So this is something we can actually tune. All of this is to try to tell you, now we have discovered the super exchange interaction directly in Ramsey sequence. Well, Anna Maria Ray and, uh, and Michael Mammoth had to come up with this protocol where you can actually, individual planes, you can use so-called Heisenberg spin interactions to create a large spin, and then use this uh, spin, uh, 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 the spin orbital coupling along the Z direction to generate the XXZ interactions to, to spin squeeze these large 1D spins in the, in the system such that achieving three-dimensional three optical lattice all being spin squeezed at once. And so this is the something we will be moving towards. And I just want to conclude my talk by saying, uh, in the three-dimensional optical lattice where you actually turn off spin uh, tunneling, there's still something really interesting going on. 
Okay, and that's just the last part of my talk in maybe another minute, Anna Maria. Uh, so the now, now I'm turning off the tunneling, and these atoms are confined in deep optical lattices. And this turns into, when you drive the atomic superposition, this turns into a dipolar spin lattice because there's a very feeble optical dipole working on with a 10 to the minus 6 goodbye, one micro goodbye dipole moment. Well, you, when you have hundreds of thousands of atoms in there, you can have a cooperative lamp shift to these dipolar have collective interactions. And it's actually a very interesting system. Many uh, theoretical uh, uh, ideas have been proposed to study uh, this collective dipolar interactions. It's a, it's a real part of the dissipative part, which is, uh, super, uh, you have heard, super radiance. But this is really looking at the real uh, frequency shift of the clock. And, and again, we use imaging spectroscopy I mentioned earlier. You can just let it interact for a while and just image what's, where the excited state, where the ground state. And you can actually indeed measure all the dipolar collective lamp shifts. You can change a different collapse golden coefficient. You can see the dipolar shift scales like this with a tipping angle. And, and it, uh, you know, for clock, you just want to make sure that this dipolar shift is not causing your systematic effect. So, it's a very assuring. You can measure those effects and down to the tantamount of standing level. And, and, and you can also enhance the dipolar interactions to actually generate spin squeezing in the future. And this is the, my final slide. Uh, you know, dipole-dipole interaction is when you have to drive this coherent superposition. What if I actually don't drive even coherent superposition, just have atoms sitting there, separated in their own lattice site? There is the so-called Van der Waals interactions that people actually use in these days, readable gates. People use Van der Waals interactions, right? But if it, you, it, we tend to ignore that these atoms sitting in the ground state, they also have interactions. Van der Waals interactions is just very weak. Uh, these Van der Waals interactions in the, in the past, when you talk about cold collisions, atoms coming together, there's a collision of scattering length. But these days, well, you can just ask yourself to calculate what are the, uh, uh, the Van der Waals interaction between two particles that's separated by 0.4 micron. And it turns out these are at a scale of tens of a microhertz, and you can actually measure these things. So with that, I think I'm at the end. Uh, I want to thank the many uh, contributing group members. Uh, you know, for example, Christian Sanders is actually here, ex except he's no longer his name is in gray because he has left our group. He has his own research group now in Colorado State. Um, and uh, I want to thank many collaborators, uh, including both experimentalists in Jela and the theorists from around the world, and, and particularly Anna Maria Ray for long-term theory collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Jun, for the great talk. So we are open for questions. Maybe I'll start with one question. I was curious about, um, at the beginning of your talk, you showed these dephasing ellipses, right, for the vertically yes. separated sample. And I remember back then, we we're always wondering what, what is limiting then, uh, what is limiting or what is introducing residual dephasing. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the current state? Is it basically the excited state lifetime that we are seeing? Or is there yet another effect that is limiting um, given the laser noise doesn't contribute at all, I guess. Yes, so, so the dephasing, actually the, the 3D lattice work had shown some really interesting, I didn't show the data, has, has shown really interesting, when you, when you put more particles into, into pancakes, you will actually see where the, the, where the coherence is maximized versus minimized depending on what lattice steps you use. And it has something to do with the, with the fluctuation of S wave and P wave. Uh, and it's so, so in some sense, the density-related effect. And it was, so in the 1D lattice, where density is 10 times, uh, 10, oh no, 100 times smaller than the, the Fermi gas, the decoherence should, in fact, be really well beyond 120 seconds that we are dealing with. So what we observed at the time, I think we are not uh, in 2020, 2021, is limited by technical noise, by magnetic field fluctuation and so on. So. We, we will go back to revisit this now that we understand this a lot, lot better from two years down the road. And we are very uh, confident we probably will be able to see coherence a lot longer than what we've demonstrated in the past. So the density, density effect is important. 
Um, but it, you know, setting where the, the depth is is actually quite important. Before, we were not able to see this very clearly, right, because the density wasn't high enough. So whether it's a 10, 15 recoil, 12 E recoil, 18 E recoil, didn't make too much a difference. But in the 3D lattice, when density is 100 times more, you go to 15 recoil, 12 E recoil, you see big difference in coherence. Um, and, and so we can now set exactly where the coherence, the maximum coherence is and tune, tune the technical noise out. We have questions in the back. You can use this microphone. Back. Uh, hi, June. Very interesting. On one of your early slides, when you were showing your results from 2013, yes. in addition to the SZ squared term, you also had N minus 1 times SZ term? Yes. yes. Can you comment on the physics of that term and the prefactor that comes with it? That, that term just comes from the fact that the, the grounds, so that interaction is coming from the P-wave interaction. The P-wave interaction itself has uh, different contribution from the ground state and the excited state, and they are not necessarily equal. So, so is that also estimating or, or sensitive to some kind of relative time delay and can be used as a clock then? No, the, this is a, this would be something which is just an offset. You know, it's a it's an offset. It's, it's actually does not really cause a frequency shift. It's a phase shift, but that phase shift comes from the fact that the S, the P wave interaction is not equal when you're in the ground state or in the excited state. Mm -hmm. Well, well, it could cause a frequency shift, but typically it's removed by an echo. It's a single particle in, a, in some sense, yeah. This is actually, this is a picture, sorry, <laughs> Christian, no, no, this is a picture that very recently we got. You, you can see the coherence. This is now density that's 100 times more. This is 10 to the 13 per centimeter cube of Fermi gas density. And you can see the coherence in 3D lattice when you are, when you apply no transverse confinement, the coherence reaches a half a minute when you are in the 15E recoil. In one D lattice, if you scale this down, this will re this will be hundreds of seconds, and and that's why I'm saying that density limit is now uh, should not be a problem, but it used to be a problem. This is with the, with a lot of echo pulse that remove. Yeah, this so. is with a lot of echo pulse also. <laughs> this is with X Y eight. So, but the echo pulse is to remove sing single particle physics. That, that's why I'm saying you know that going back two years ago, there's likely this uh, magnetic field noise was limiting us. Mm -hmm. You can use this microphone. Thanks for the nice talk. You ma made this comment when you introduced spin squeezing that the advantage offered by spin squeezing goes away when the particle number exceeds 10. So I was curious to know why, why that was, or maybe I misunderstood. Um, it just has something to do with the, the, you know, in the, in the, in the tweezer experiment, the, the so-called Rydberg addressing is using Rydberg blockade mechanism. And the blockade radius may influence only few atoms in the neighboring uh, states. But the, the, fundamentally, the entanglement gate is between two particles. And in order to propagate out, it will take a more circuit depth. Um, so, so this is really the, the limitation in terms of how quantum information is propagating throughout your entire, entire system. In the, in the short range of physics, your entanglement is, is to your neighbors. And, and it, so this entanglement may not survive over large distance. And this is what experimentally verifying. Once you go beyond eight particles, in fact, actually, in an atomic experiment, that spin squeezing saturates. But maybe you can do error corrections. You can do things like that, that, that you can continue to allow yourself to use short range physics to build up the long range spin squeezing across the whole system. It will take some time. To do it, you know. When I say take some time, meaning the physical system takes some time. Not a, not a, uh, for us to learn to how to do this will also take some time. I will mention a little bit more of these tricks that you is talking in my talk. So thank you for the great talk. I, I have a question about the cavity. You mentioned there is some unexpected noise which you think comes from uh, uh, the semiconductors. Could you? Uh, clarify a bit more, is that some fundamental limit or you think it's just a material issue? We think it has something to do with the carrier dynamics. <laughs> so you, you, may be, you, you, you may be curious to ask why I was able to say, you know, we can reach below the, the fundamental Brownian thermal noise and yet there's another layer of noise that's, that's limiting us and we could, could not understand the origin of it. And that's because it's actually, 
interesting if you look at the correlation length of the noise, the fundamental thermal noise is a very short range correlated. Uh, as the correlation length is extremely short range. That means that that's the reason why when, in, when you have these local fluctuations, if you make the laser beam to larger, larger, larger mode size, the noise actually averages away. That's why LIGO likes to use big beams mm -hmm. to average away the thermal noise. It's because of this, this correlation lengths tend to be small. So we can take this to, to, to study, for example, in the new semiconductor material, we can actually study by using TM0 mode, TM00 mode, or TM01 mode, TM02 mode. You can use different mode areas. To, and also, depending on your mode overlap, you can actually see how much the noise is common because TM00 versus TM01, there's a 70% overlapping factor spatially. So you can actually see how the noise scales when you compare TM00 mode against TM01 mode and see if the noise scales 70% less and so on. The global noise, on the other hand, is actually very large length scale. Uh, typically that's less concerning, because this one is the more fundamental limit. It's due to the, the thermal dissipation fluctuation theorem. The global noise uh, tends to be, I would even call it coherent noise because it's a, it's a, the correlation length is uh, very long, it's global scale. And, and it, uh, in this particular case, what we found is this residual noise that's associated with this uh, crystalline coding is, has this length scale that, that's on the global scale. That, that it, it's, it's almost like the entire film is going up and down like this. And, and we think it has something to do with the carrier dynamics where um, you, you have a photon hitting on these semiconductor material that's generating some sort of a carrier dynamics. We don't really know the reason why. Uh, it, it, somehow there's some electrical field that's driving the carrier and, and they come up with this noise. And, but yet this noise is very much uh, something that we have to solve if you want to push the interferometer performance further. And just a quick follow up, does it decrease with the temperature? Yeah, no, it does not. It does and, not. Uh, yeah, so at least we studied, uh, thank you, we studied at its 4 Kelvin, 16 Kelvin, and, and then at PTB oh. at 124 Kelvin, they all scale about, about the same noise level. It doesn't depend on the temperature, which is also very different from the fundamental <laughs> Thermal fluctuation. Thank you. We will have to move on, but I think hopefully for the break we can have uh, continued discussions. Yeah. And let's thanks one more time, June, for the very nice talk. Oh, thank you.